Okay, I'm going to speak on managing the, the anxious portorient. And you know that the clocks move up tonight, so we'll be starting early, just so you know. So if, don't want to be later for uh, the meeting tomorrow. Okay, so let's talk about managing the anxious parturient. And we'll skip. So the objectives are we're going to discuss the influence of the obstetrical events of anxiety and satisfaction during childbirth. We're going to discuss the interrelationships of pain, anxiety, and fatigue on the overall labor experience. And we're going to discuss techniques to manage the anxious laboring parturient. So what are facts about anxiety in pregnancy? Well, it's an especially sensitive time for the mom, and antinatal anxiety is strongly associated with postnatal anxiety. So if you have a negative experience antenatally, it can cause problems afterwards. So the transition can definitely be difficult. There's a lot of changes, and um, in that it, there is a high expectations of joy. So especially for the primes, that if you're coming in and you expect something and you're not going to get that, then it can really lead to a lot of problems. So it can cause disappointment. So mothers also who have had a cesarean delivery are known to have higher levels of anxiety compared to delivering vaginally. In the postnatal period, so if you have problems in the postnatal period, that can affect and you can actually have a difficult mother-infant interaction afterwards. So other facts regarding anxiety. So satisfaction can be predicted by the labor expectations and also the mode of delivery. Failure to provide an adequate analgesia can cause anxiety and stress. The postnatal anxiety is associated with poor health, pain and depression, and as I said, if you have a negative childbirth experience, that can actually lead to postpartum depression. And satisfaction is predicted during a labor experience by mother's expectations, her mode of delivery, and any negative experiences that she might have. The fear of childbirth, it, is, it, it's, it's, it does have an incidence, and it can be as high as about 25%. And it is a complex period. So there's physical changes that go along with the mom. There's emotional changes, there's life events. It's one of the most memorable changes in her life. There's expectations, and that can all lead to anxiety. So the fear of childbirth is highly prevalent. It's a negative emotion, and it does cause high levels of stress and anxiety, and you can get emotional maladaptation. As I said, it's, the incidence can be as high as 25%, and that, that's using the uh, WIJMA, W-I-J-M-A expectancy experience questionnaire. And if you have a score greater than 66, that is highly indicative of uh, fear of childbirth. And as far as what's this relationship, it's a specific sub subset of uh, anxiety, and it's totally different from general anxiety and or depression. Fear of childbirth, there's few studies about the, well, what about the, the father's role into it? So the father's role is unknown, and there's few studies that have actually looked at it. But most commonly, there's some, um, some strategies that can be used to try and prevent. And what have we been using lately? Well, we, you attend Lamaze classes, so that can help decrease anxiety, and also a birth plan. And I just show right here is just a, a Lamaze class here, and hopefully it just... There's no sound. It's just trying to get you to smile a little bit this morning. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, well, you know, it's tougher for men. It just, it, well, physiologically, they couldn't do it, and, and I totally agree. In fact, I'll share this with you. What was funny is, um, well, men couldn't have babies, and there was like two reasons. Well, first, they couldn't have it, or if they did have it, they'd only have one. And the other reason, if men had to have babies, then they would find better analgesia control. So I sort of, when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's pretty amazing. Okay. So birth plans. Let's talk about birth plans. Well, its main purpose, it came in the 1980s, and it was to decrease or reduce the medicalization, to more make it more natural experience, and to give mom more control. And there's really studies out there that show that with the birth plan, there is, there is small improvements that, that are, are made. But the more you can match their birth plan, the better their experience and the better their expectations are. 
So fear of childbirth is there's how can you how do you conquer it? What can you do? What kind of strategies can you use? Well, there's specific cognitive strategies that can be used, and one of the things that's going on now is mindful-based programs. So there's it, it can be used. There's a variety of psychological and physical conditions that it can be used for, including depression, anxiety, stress, and chronic pain. And you can use mindful-based programs to use for stress reduction, you can use it for cognitive therapy, and you can also use it for parenting. It's also available after the child is born. So this is the cycle here, and it basically just shows the maladaptation and normal adaptation. So if, in, if you just look on, on this sign here, so you have unbalanced emotions, where if you had mindful based and you're able to, to deal with this stress in a, in a good way, you'd have balanced emotions. And then here, your self-focus, where it's maladaptation, whereas you can have reflective attention. So this would give you realistic beliefs, and here it just leads to catastrophic beliefs. So what we want is we want the mother to be more realistic and to be more mindful and in tune of uh, the labor experience. And this just shows that, that right here that she's just, uh, this picture here, that she's just exhausted from trying to be stronger than she actually feels. And it's just like a negative experience. So what is mindful-based programs? So it's basically based on Buddhism, and it's the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally. So it's a quality, it's like an attention. So you realize that things are going on, and you would accept it for what it is and for where it's at. So you know that it's happening, but you're okay with it. So I actually, I probably, we all need this when we go to work. It would be really good. So you observe the physical sensations. So you feel that you're having pain. You can feel the contractions. And they're in control of their thoughts and emotions. And they, they're working and on accepting the way that it is. So that's more of a mindful-based uh, program in using that. So what, what about the association? Is there association between pain, anxiety, and fatigue in, in pregnancy? Yes, there is a, a, an association, and it, can, it is correlated with impaired fertility, post-traumatic stress disorder, antenatal and postnatal depressive symptoms, and in, increased requests for cesarean delivery. And if you can relieve one, there is a the, the correlation that pain, anxiety, and fatigue are interrelated, and that by relieving one, you might be able to relieve the others too. Zhang actually looked at this interrelationships regarding pain, anxiety, and fatigue with and without epidural, and I'll show you what he came up with with his results. So his objectives, he was looking at the correlations between pain, anxiety, and fatigue with and without a labor epidural, and he wanted to look at the influence that each, and one, each of all of those three had on the labor and delivery experience. So in his methods, he divided the phases of labor into four phases. Phase one was two to four centimeters, phase two was four to six. Phase three was up to 10 centimeters, complete cervical dilatation, and phase four was immediately after delivery. And he looked, he just used three visual, visual analog scales, and that was to pain, to anxiety, and also to fatigue. And he found that there was a strong correlation between intrapartum pain, anxiety, and fatigue and with or without labor epidural. So if you had it or didn't have it, there still was a strong correlation, and especially during phases one and three. So phase one is early labor, phase three is up to 10 centimeters dilatation and active pushing. And that for patients who received labor epidural analgesia, the level of fatigue decreased more slowly than levels of pain and anxiety. And I'll show you the interrelationship, but all three are correlated, but they all do not change at the same time. So this is a pretty busy slide, and it's pretty interesting And if you just look at it. So this is the time periods of the labor phases, so one through four, and this is basically all the pain, anxiety, and fatigue. The lower ones are, they have labor epidural analgesia, so that's good. So we provide labor epidural analgesia, and you can decrease all three things, pain, fatigue, and anxiety, which is good. And this is the subset or the cohort that did not get, so minus labor epidural analgesia. And if you look at this, look, there are higher levels. So 
they're more likely, so this is, um, and they'll come down. So it, usually pain, it, it increases, and then you get a labor epidural and look at it, it drops. Same with anxiety. They have some anxiety, you get a labor epidural, and it tends to drop. And look at fatigue, though. If you look at fatigue, that's much higher. So even though they get a labor epidural analgesia, it, there's still fatigue can be high. So there are some correlations, but there's differences in it. In fact, fatigue can be a major reason of why they choose to get a labor epidural and why they could get a, a negative labor epidural experience or, or during the whole experience for delivery. So the mode of delivery was correlated with the age, parity, the pain level in phase two, so that's uh, four to six centimeters dilatation, and also the anxiety level in phase two of labor. Labor epidural analgesia leads to significant decline in anxiety and fatigue, so I showed you that, and also fatigue was not easily diminished. So if they're tired, they're tired with or without a, a labor epidural. So in the results, it did show that there was a correlation between all three. So pain, anxiety, and fatigue, they were correlated, especially during phase one and at 10 centimeters uh, cervical dilatation. And there are the three concurrent sim symptoms all developed in a consistent way. As you've seen that, that chart, it, all three went up and up, and they all went down too, with or without labor epidural. So the intensity of one, sy one symptom can increase the intensity of the other two symptoms. So fatigue, it consumes, so that's an, an, another issue, and it does consume a lot of energy, and it can lead, so you're, you're, you're pushing, you're, you're using a lot of energy, so you get the fatigue, and that can actually lead to increased anxiety. So by decreasing labor pain, you can decrease anxiety, which and you can also decrease fatigue. So fatigue is cumulative. It definitely adds up, and it's not easily reduced. As I showed you with the labor epidural, it's not as much as the, the pain and anxiety. Uh, fatigue was the strongest of the three, and it was most hardest to, to get rid of. And if it accumulates, so the more fatigue that you get, you sort of get this snowball effect where it just gets worse. You, you get more fatigue, you increase your pain, you increase your anxiety, and you're more likely to request a labor epidural. So patients that received the labor epidural had significantly high pain and fatigue, so that may be the reason why they requested a labor epidural. And it does have, fatigue does have an important role in the decision to request a labor epidural. For women who did not receive it, the, the intensity of the symptoms increased steadily, and you saw that, so that it, they increased more than just a labor epidural alone. And it's really important what they recommend is that you have ongoing assessment. So it's not just a, you get the labor epidural and you don't worry about it, that there should be an, an assessment all throughout the labor and delivery process. And they especially stress that nurses can help to reduce the anxiety at these specific time periods. Uh, primes, so they definitely have a higher rate of, of pain, and they're more likely to request a labor epidural. And they do, in this study, showed that they have higher pain in phase one of labor than those who did not, and it's basically explained that they have higher pain scores. And they're thinking that, and they also had higher anxiety. So one of the reasons they're thinking maybe they might request a labor epidural, maybe they might have a higher pain score, is that um, the higher anxiety, so you're not able to actually, uh, it leads to more muscle tension and more resistance, so therefore you're more likely to have more pain and therefore request a, a labor epidural. So it does suggest the necessity of decreasing maternal anxiety during labor. So how about postnatal fatigue? So one of the things is that uh, even after you deliver, you, you can tell the moms a lot of times it's just very just wiped out, so the big time fatigue. So t it's really important that we can increase the or decrease her fatigue by giving her more energy and maybe offering her some oral sustenance immediately afterwards. So I know this is a hot topic and uh, um, Dr. Um, uh, Sullivan is gonna speak more about this later, but maybe you know the nurses could maybe be more interactive so they can notice what the fatigue levels are. If they seem to really fatigue and the baby's delivered, maybe we can give a, you know some food, some sustenance, some sustenance to go ahead and increase your energy store so we don't get that negative postnatal experience and postnatal depression and all the things that can happen after delivery. 
So nurses can provide helpful interventions. They can re recommend new mothers eat and oral, have oral sustenance. They can provide a relaxing and calm environment. And they can also help the partori to get good quality sleep after delivery. And labor satisfaction and what comes out of it, it's mainly through unmet expectations. And if you have that, so you come in, you have a birth plan, you, you just have this ideal of how you think it's going to go and it doesn't go that way, so it can definitely lead with dissatisfaction. But one thing is that it's important to have a labor epidural, but it's not just the whole labor epidural, it's the whole experience. And in fact, Hodnett, Hodnett performed a systemic review, and this is what he noticed, that the, the satisfaction from the whole experience comes from the personal expectations, caregiver support, the quality of caregiver-patient relationship, involvement um, in, in the decision-making is also another important. So all those factors come into it along with the labor epidural and, and proper analgesia. So in conclusion, pain, anxiety, and fatigue are interrelated. Labor epidural analgesia can reduce the big three, pain, anxiety, and fatigue, throughout all phases of labor. Labor epidural can significantly decrease anxiety and fatigue, but not as much. And fatigue accumulates in a stepwise fashion, and then a multidisciplinary coaching approach is necessary, so involvement from all teams. And that's it. Thank you.